everyone, if you're not already familiar, uh, my dear friend, Teresa Pascal, is a trauma specialist. She's a contemplative practitioner and action teacher, is the author of Sacred Wounds, which is a book that just came out about spiritual trauma and church hurt. I'm going to put a link up here in a second. You should check it out if you haven't already. She's on the leadership team for the Transform Network, which is this awesome network which helps connect other networks and communities to create movements for social change and transformation. So welcome, Teresa. So I would love to hear, you know, you, your expertise is the sort of nexus of, of contemplative practice, activism, and trauma. And that invariably forms, I would imagine, your perspective on Christology. So how do you see your work, and particularly in Sacred Wounds, maybe, interacting with what you've had a chance to uh, digest from the Homebrewed Guide to Jesus? Sure. Yeah, so many thoughts. There's <laughs> Uh, reading through the text, what I was able to read. It's interesting because I think coming myself from sort of a very um, socially liberal but Catholic family, I forget uh, how much of the unpacking of the, the mystical, of that space of unknowing has to happen for people that come out of more fundamental or conservative evangelical vantage points. And so every time I read, you know, kind of, the kind of content like what you wrote about trip it reminds me of how much there is to unpack you know and that a lot of it seems like a lot of what you're doing in the book is breaking down and sometimes quite like kind of um like punch in the face you know like there's a moment of a phrase or, or sort of just kind of um disrupting or disturbing old theologies and old christologies by putting things out there that to me in my relational experience with God was almost intuitive, but I realized people don't learn. What I, what I realized is people in more fundamental tradition don't learn spiritual intuition. And so in a way, it seems like what you're doing is unpacking the language around the thinking because so much of evangelical tradition is brain first, God knowing versus heart and spirit first, God knowing. And so it seems like there's a lot of that unpacking of the brain first knowing so that people can almost be prepared to sit in that space spiritually, which I think is another, it's a whole other learning. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a good observation and you didn't know this, but Mike did, um, that, uh, one of the whole sections that got moved when I, you know, first doing the book, uh, is, uh, more emphasis on Jesus, the historical Jesus and that kind of thing, which ended up having to collapse a lot of the later chapters which get to more kind of cosmic, mystical, and that type of understandings of, of Christology. And at first I thought, I mean, I was, obviously I could have made the book three times as long, uh, because I like writing and reading myself, but th there's that problem. But, uh, uh, the other part about it I get is, is something you said that, um, in, and I'm kind of telling my experience as a very Protestant, uh, person and how when these kind of, uh, <clears throat> log jams of spiritual imagination get broken by Jesus, by the historical Jesus, by dealing with the text, by doing that, then it actually opened up to this uh, rather rich spiritual relationship uh, to God. Um, one of the stories that would have been in the larger one was actually this moment where, and I talk about in the book, where the historical Jesus kind of breaks this rather shallow image of Jesus I was trying to protect. And at the same time is when I discovered Meister Eckhart and contemplative prayer. And um, if one of the things in reading back through the book I would want to say stronger is how you come to lack an anxiousness around not knowing the answer yet and pursuing it when you're able to rest in the presence of God. And as you come to see that as this um, uh, Christophonic space, then... I think it can inspire a lot of of, of creative uh, reflection uh, theologically. Absolutely. And like you said, enter into that mystical space because some of, you know, speaking to the sacred wounds and the research that I did a lot, getting stories and kind of list, just listening to people and, and many of them coming from evangelical, more fundamental backgrounds. Um, it is the idea that God is in the word, right? So God is in the thinking and the problem with that is kind of what you're saying is that, um, you know, when, when God, what I found was when God is in the thinking for people, then to get rid of the things they know is like taking away the God, 
you know, mm-hmm. so it's like a breaking down of the way that they understand God and nobody's taught them yet how to understand God in their heart and their spirit. And so there's this frantic, you know, particularly as people are breaking away from tradition, it's this frantic place. The unknowing is terrifying because it feels like it's godless when it really isn't. It's just thoughtless. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Cause like, uh, I think it's in chapter seven. I don't remember, but I talk about how uh, Elizabeth Johnson, when she's developing this uh, kind of cosmic eco-feminist Christology, emphasizes the radical solidarity of God with all flesh and the deep incarnations, uh, the concept she's developing. And she highlights that God doesn't become human like Anthropos. God becomes Sark's materiality. And how odd is it for us, right, to think we are being distanced from God when our understanding the words and things are being deconstructed when the whole gospel story is God getting materialized and coming to dwell right in the dirtiness of things. Um, and even one of the things the mystics emphasize, like the resurrected Christ still has the wounds. That's the very place that is near and dear to God are these materialities, these hurts, these pains. Uh, and uh, that is a, uh, it requires a certain type of, uh, what would be the phrase like uh i don't know. to 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 think that seems reasonable requires a, a a breakdown of your inherited theology uh that isn't i don't know i haven't figured out a good way to describe it so um how would you how, how would you describe the turning point in one's kind of spiritual journey and reflecting about the tradition where it turns for being a kind of defense and learning and articulating ideas to the ideas being kind of like uh, one of the energetic places that kind of uh, spring forth uh, life and that kind of stuff. Well, and I think for most people, and one of my teachers, Richard Rohr, always talks about this, but he says all transformation comes through pain. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately for all of us, there's an essential painfulness to the process. You know, that I think the point of breaking through is really also often the point of breaking down. Now, for some people, that may just literally be that they've broken down the text and their thinking space so much that that in itself can feel like a falling apart. But for other people, it can be just radical suffering experience in the world. So sometimes that's injustice, but oftentimes it's a personal experience of some kind of a hurt, suffering, oppression, injustice that that is too big for a, a God that's made only of thoughts mm-hmm. to fit or to be with or to sit with, that we need to break open to a space where it's not about God who gives me the answers, the information, the thinking stuff, but rather it's God that sits with me in relationship. The way I talk a lot about relationship with God in this kind of way of like, if it's transactional, you know, if it's constantly like my thought about you and then how I think you think about me and then I pray to you and I think that you respond to me and it's, it's transactional. That's an unhealthy relationship. That's a dysfunctional relationship. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times that relationship has to break down entirely. And it doesn't work when we, when we experience real suffering. It no longer works, no longer holds. And then it has to break through to a relational experience of God. And really Jesus is the embodiment, you know, the Christology. That's the embodiment of the relational experience of God. Like mm-hmm. you said, beyond knowing the information of God, it's the experience of being in a relationship. Jesus embodied that for us. And we're, and that's really the full expression of God. So I think hurt often breaks through to that understanding of God as a presence with us rather than a thought to help us understand. Yeah, and, and I think one of the genius moments in 20th century Christology is the reverse, that the same is actually true for God. One of the radical parts of Christian theology is that uh, that God embraced the wounds and trauma of existence into the divine life. Right, like the contemplative teachers have, all, have taught this from our end, and this Christological affirmation is like, you know, it's reciprocal. Like the pathos, the passion of God is one where this love becomes vulnerable to our finitude, our brokenness, and risks loving in this deep and rich way. Uh, and the like, the the synchronicity of those two is beautiful because, right. God does that in order to reveal the love of God for us in the world, and we have to go through through pain and process it to come to understand and receive the love of God. How odd would it be for Christians to think that it would just be done in the level of the abstract in the head on uh, coming from both directions? Uh, it, it would be dysfunctional, and it would also be uh, way too common, right? Like I think that's 
I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges uh, facing the church is our temptation to just not go there. Mm-hmm. And that's the true nature of relationship. So the true nature of relationship is reciprocal. So if we are if we are an iteration of God in the world, and all of our relationship is not one sided, but it's it's reciprocal, then it's you know once you get to that place of understanding God as relationship, then it's almost it, it has to be both ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. It strikes me that when I consider both of both of your works, you know, Trip coming in this book from a perspective that God is like Jesus. And, and you, Teresa, coming from a perspective of uh, contemplative heart, that, that you're both making a very definite statement about God that I think is different than the sort of um, either moral therapeutic deism or Calvinism in that you're saying that being with God is inherently, relationship with God is inherently vulnerable, inherently uh, reciprocal, not only, you know, on our parts, but on God's part, kind of making that move. Mm-hmm. So thank you so much, Teresa, for being here with us. Enjoy your, your marathon chat. All right. Next up, we have Mr. Tony Jones. Uh-oh. Dun, dun, dun. Dr. Jones. What's up? Yo, how's it going, Tony? You got you got a bunch of 30 claps without doing anything. I've been on here... Uh, like three and a half hours, and I have 268. And you clap for yourself? Doesn't look like it. Dang. <laughs> oh, man. Well, so uh, Tony, for those of you who do not know, is an author. He's a teacher. He's a practical theologian. And among other things, is now the editor of the Theology for the People series at Fortress Press, which makes him Tripp's editor in this capacity. And oh my, we've been joined by a furry friend as well. This is Albert. I Albert. like Albert. What's, what's a three to five line bio about Albert? He will be hunting ducks tomorrow night in North Dakota. Very nice. That's what he. That's what you need to know about him. All right. Awesome. Um, All right. Jesus behind me is walking on water. I want. I'd like you to tell me uh, by what by what properties of physics. Do you think Jesus walked on water? What properties of physics? I don't yeah, like how did, how did that happen? I don't. I don't think Jesus walked on water. Think that's just a story? No, I don't think it's just a story. Just a story is one of those like ways that progressive Christians end up dismissing something of significant importance. Um, but the reason around and uh, the reason around na- nature miracles being problematic is around the problem of evil. Um, when the uh, when divine power can in invade, intervene, and determine uh, natural things, it kind of puts God on the hook for cancer, uh, for all sorts of times that uh, people have drowned and wish they had uh, had this uh, this special uh, uh, Jesus's daddy juice to uh, walk on the water. Um, and so it really is a problem of evil that makes me think about divine action to. Uh, articulate and argue for an understanding of divine action that doesn't include this kind of uh, uh, divine God acting by divine intervention. Um, that's a, uh, that is a philosophical and metaphysical line of argument, uh, but God's presence in an action in the world is developed Christologically. Uh, in the so world. why would God be so careless as to allow, you know, a, a misleading story that kind of mal- backhandedly maligns God's character into the text? I, I will it, given that uh, it, divine intervention is what I'm rejecting, I'm not sure it would be sheer carelessness that things get into the text or tradition that are uh, uh, less than perfectly uh, revealing uh, the reality of God. Uh, I mean, and the other part about it is uh, the Christian affirmation of the incarnation has a whole – is unrelated to any single one min, uh, a, a miracle, and the affirmation of the resurrection is – uh, is a an affirmation of an event that isn't historical in uh, the proper category. So a lot of times when we're debating like walking on water or whatever and what those things look like, uh, people assume that up for grabs is something like the incarnation and resurrection. And I think theologically, um, the the difference between those two couldn't be more vast. Okay, the bigger question I think is a hermeneutical question, and that is. Who do you think is the intended author of the Gospels? 
Come uh, on, riff on that for a while, Mr. Not the intended audience with the intended author. Okay, well, yeah. I, no, I actually think this is important, and I joke about it in in, in the book that uh, there's kind of the Gospels are pushbacks to all sorts of rampant assumptions from the 19th century. That uh, the Gospels are really this uh, amazing source to get back to a historical Jesus that we can then use as a cleaver against the Church and its doctrine. Uh, it's like, yeah, kind of. But everything you're reading are from a bunch of people that think God raised the homeless dead Jew, and that's why they're even telling the story. Um, uh, part of the the hermeneutical awareness is to see that the Gospels are not um, a a kind of direct report. They're testimony. They're testimony narratives. They're witnesses to the presence of the risen Christ in the community. Uh, one of the things I liked about the book. I mean, I liked a lot of it, but one of the things no one's brought up uh, thus far, and I never even heard what Tony thought about it, is my argument for a rather inclusive theological diversity of the church precisely from canon, that um, uh, in the early church, this harmony gospel of Tatian, where you work out all the kinks, like in John, Jesus clears the temple at the beginning, the other three, the end, Tatian's like, he did it twice. Uh, tell the Sermon on the Mount and Sermon on the Plain near each other, but he told them twice. There's not one version that's kind of getting reported different. Um, and the church rejects this harmony gospel and then puts in two canon four divergent and differing testimonies to the risen Christ by telling the story of Jesus. And in them you have different Christologies, right? The gospel of Mark, you identify the person of Jesus with God at the baptism. Uh, in in Romans, Paul identifies it through the resurrection. Uh, in Matthew and Luke, it's through the conception. The, and through, in John, it's a Logos Christology. When we take all this diversity of Christologies in the New Testament and say the answer is Trinity, we're doing hermeneutical violence to the New Testament. And what we're doing is becoming Tatianites with a, uh, uh, I- imperial sanctioned, uh, Christological key, namely the creeds, as opposed to recognizing that the New Testament pushes against our desire for sameness when it goes to our testimonies and Christological reflections. Um, okay. You're getting way too many claps here because I, you were sitting at 300 for a while, and I thought at 74, with about five minutes left, I could probably hit 300. All right. Well, I, I will start clicking, and, and I want to know if what you thought about uh, 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 Canon as... Um, I don't think I've really actually read that part of the book. (laughs) No, uh, I'll tell you what I remember is um, in remember in like uh, when you're in seminary and you have to buy the gospel parallels, you know, the synopsis quatuor uh, evangelorium, evangelorium or whatever. I forget the Latin, but and I remember getting that buying that book in seminary and you know when you flip through it and you see the four gospels running in parallel and seeing the places where they uh you know overlap and the places where there's you know john will have something and then all three synoptics are totally white like just empty columns and then there's john and then vice versa um i i of course, I think those conflicts and contradictions in those stories that are told twice or thrice in the Gospels differently have been a big um, challenge for a lot of people. I guess even back then, I did not find it that challenging, though I do remember going to the Fuller Seminary Library and finding Tatian's Harmonized Gospel and checking it out. And, you know, it had each um, it had color codings for um, each gospel and how it was put together. So if it was in purple, it was from Mark or whatever. Um, I think all those, you know, one thing I like about your book um, is, is that it, and it, I, I encourage all nonfiction writers to write like this is that it, it tells, it builds a conflict. It builds a narrative. So in a lot of nonfiction books, you read the first chapter and you get the whole book, right? And then it's seven more chapters of this, the author working out the same idea seven different ways, saying, saying the same thing eight different times. 
And um, I like in your book that you did really work at building an argument over the course of, you know, 40, 45,000 words and over those chapters. And I like the fact that it fits in your back pocket. Oh, yeah. And if you order it before the end of the day on the 8th, you can get uh, a whole stack of free uh, high gravity classes with me, Peter Rollins, me and Philip Clayton. Uh, so you could put it in your back pocket, never read it, and just listen to the classes on your iPad. And uh, you'd make your money right there. Boom, what? shakalaka. I'll also yeah. say that it didn't initially fit in your back pocket. So <laughs> did you have to like trim down the margins, or that's one way to say it. So we had to trim. We had a trim trip, and that's not the only time I've had to trim trip. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> His beard, people. Come on. Jeez. Oh, okay. We're losing viewers by the second. Well, um, one of the things that uh, I was wondering, Tony, is uh, how did you like uh, the uh, atonement work in it? I mean, you have a whole book on why God killed Jesus. Well, I thought you'd never mention it. Here, here it is. Two minutes left. Mike, me, Mike mentioned everybody else's book in their intro, but forgot mine. Oh, man. Ooh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, link now to tone. I'm sure he'll tweet out a link to it now for sure. Um, you know, I think you and I agree a lot on the atonement. I, de- you know, I, um, I'm pretty processy in where I land the plane in that book. I think you and I both have similar criticisms of, uh, the payment model of the atonement. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I think you and I are, are pretty much on the same page and you just spent, Last night, talking about uh, multi, Yergi multi. Oh, yeah. That's some killer atonement right there. Hashtag, hashtag <laughs> unintended. Well, uh, w- one of the things that came up in uh, in the uh, Crucified God uh, discussion I did last night, the Homebrew Community Group, we have a reading group called Epic Reads, and Philip Clayton and I, um, do read through books together, and then everyone that's in the group gets on, and we all talk, and have a little hoorah. Um, reading Crucified God again, um, I read it and then realized how much more of Moltmann was in my book than I thought was. Right? Like I thought I brought him up in two very specific places to make a point, and then I realized that chapter six in the Crucified God is one of the most influential chapters in my head. Um, and I even realized in it that he does a uh, appropriation and modification of Whitehead's critique of the doctrine of God through Western civilization – and I end up doing the same thing without um, without uh, deciding in a random footnote that process theology doesn't lead to a real Christology. He, he wormed his way into your head, bro. I know. It's, it's very he dangerous. Up, and I'll just say before I go that uh, any, any listeners or viewers who are coming to the American Academy of Religion, they should bring their old tattered copy of Crucified God. And they can get Moltmann to sign it in the Fortress Press booth. And then they can buy the new 40th anniversary edition with a new intro uh, forward by Miroslav Volf. And maybe they can get Moltmann to sign your book too, dude. Yeah, well, here's the most important thing is who doesn't want a pint glass with Moltmann's cartoon head on the homebrewed Christianity monk to drink dark German lager while we talk to him about the crucified God? Have you named the beer yet? Uh, no, it gets revealed then. I can't tell Blab. If Blab ah. knows, does it, but if anyone on the side guesses... The dark German lager name for Moltmann's 40th anniversary of Crucified God uh, beer name. Then, uh, then you, I will mail you a copy of of the book and Tony's book. That's right. You'll get both of them if you can guess the name. Uh, it's very right. nerdy. Uh, you'll have to think of notions in the Crucified God that are funny and turn them into beer names, namely a rich, malty, dark German lager. Love it. All right. Beautiful. Well, thanks, Tony. Thanks for having me on, guys. Peace. Early. See ya. So, uh, everybody, this is James. James would like us to know that he likes Jesus. He blogs. He reads books. He's a seminary grad, and he's an out-of-work pastor, which means hire him, people. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to throw up uh, uh, his URL here in a second. He's actually uh, one of Speakeasy's most consistent bloggers. He writes these really 
nice, thoughtful, even-handed reviews. Doesn't always agree with the crazy progressive stuff that I, I throw at him, but he handles that with grace. And so I'm really interested to hear how he's handling the homebrew Christianity guide to Jesus thus far. That, that is there a you great go. compliment, Mike. There you go. You just out, you just outed me. I'm probably the least progressive person that you, has been on this so far, uh, oh. which is, which is fine. I mean, I, I, uh, I would just self describe myself as a confession, confessional evangelical. Um, I really enjoyed your book trip. Um, there's a lot of things I, that I really liked. I liked the freaking awesome subtitle, which it was on the cover. Um, I think you're right to take on Lewis's thing with the liar Lord. Yeah. Lunatic. I don't think Jesus ever put that on them. I think he, I think that there was more room for people to, to kind of just discover who he was. Um, that being said, I'm not as processy, um, as, as you are in a lot of your, um, your other dialogue partners today. Um, but, um, I did really love your Lagos Christology and it, it was meaningful to me. And I, and the, the kingdom of God, the drop G, um, reminded me of, of, uh, the unkingdom of God, the kind of the unkingly kingdom of, you know, Mark von Steenwick's book. Mm-hmm. So I really, really enjoyed it. Being associated uh, with him is a positive thing. <laughs> um, so, First up, I just, this is a, a question I'm, I'm dying to ask. I moved to Florida from the Pacific Northwest and I missed my Cascade hops. Um, and I mistrust IPAs east of the Rockies. This is just, so what IPA or any beer would you recommend that would bring me closer to Jesus? Uh, and it's an East Coast one? You're in anything, Florida? Anything. All in right. Florida. So in Florida, it's a very specific brewery. Your Cigar City has there you go. Uh, the best IPAs in, in the East Coast. And there's a reason. That's because their brewery, uh, their head brewer, came from Ballast Point. Um, now, you, you think this is unrelated to the book, Mike, but in the book, there's very clear uh, beer rules for homebrewed Christianity kind of scattered throughout. And one of them is... Every IPA has to at least be as tasty as the Sculpin. See, that's when you know you're reading close. The Sculpin is a very intensely dry hopped IPA made by Ballast Point. And if it's not that good, it's not really an IPA. And if you're I read gonna, that, I just intentionally blocked it out because I just don't like IPAs. No, no. <laughs> you don't. You don't have to. You know, there are different styles for different uh, strides, and um, you, you know, sometimes you need an IPA, sometimes you need a really dark saison that uh, uh, Mike has experienced. I made. Um, but yeah. So, but but is there another? Now, this is Elder of the Hops in Homebrewed Christianity Land. Tim, is there? Can you think of another uh, East Coast IPA? Um, well, the East Coast is large, so there's a lot um, up up kind of in the Northeast that are actually really good. So there's uh, I don't think they're distributed to Florida though. So that's kind of the challenge that you are yeah. uh, riding. Actually, the uh, High <laughs> Lie is the name of the Cigar City IPA that's really tasty. They also yeah. have uh, um, what's the White what's oak? The oak? Yeah, the White Oak High Lie. That's it's High oh. Lie, but it's Asian White Oak, so it's got kind of a vanilla y. Uh, oak thing going on. Um, there's a there's another brewery down there called uh, I feel like it's Cycle Brewing or something like that. That okay, I've to, yeah, yeah, you have. Okay, so that's another good one yeah. to check out. Uh, but, All right. Yeah. Well, so uh, it, it, that was my off-topic intro here. But let you say in the book, you say in, in your uh, on your podcast um, that you you provide the ingredients for. Um, for us to homebrew our own faith, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so thinking in terms of Christology, I mean, to me, that says something objective and it says something subjective um, that you, that there are ingredients to make a homebrew. If you don't have hops, you don't have grain, you don't have malts, you don't have, you don't have beer or ale, you've got something else. Yeah. Um, so what are the essential elements for a Christology? And what is just the floral finish? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would begin just by saying I think they're like Christologies, like beer styles, there's a huge diversity of them. Um, and I like to enjoy tasty versions of each versus bad versions of the, the style that's most similar to mine. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I think like when you when you think of Christology, if you're thinking of the ingredients of Christology, part of it obviously will be Jesus. Um, I think the early church was very wise yeah. in insisting on the full humanity of Jesus against different uh, popular uprisings in theology that wanted the divinity of Jesus to require a theological evacuation of parts of his humanity. Um, and I think the uh, uh, Christology itself, like the fermentation or the yeast would have to be the doctrine of the spirit. Uh, because uh, w- w- even in Acts and in the early spirit, in John, in the giving of the paraclete, um, in Jesus' own ministry, right, the indwelling of the spirit upon him in his baptism, the sharing of the spirit with the 12 and the 70, uh, in the synoptic narratives and sending them out, uh, the cr- Christology cannot be separated from the the community embodying the liberating and life-giving mission of Jesus, which is participation in the life of the spirit. Um, and then... The, the other thing that I think is happening today that's real similar to what's happening in craft beer is that it's like we realized that uh, hops, there were more than two or three strands. And we realized that, like, you can isolate yeast, reproduce something that was like this ignored little cell in a beer before. Now you isolate it, reproduce it, and let it go, and whole beautiful new flavors come into being. Um, like, one of the things I was sitting there when Robin's talking, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get that. Oh, no. Now I have to write a whole nother chapter. Like, my response wasn't, oh, you pointed out a criticism in my head and now I'm mad and I'm going to try to defend it. I thought, oh, that's a whole new avenue for Christology we need to engage and reflect and push back on. And so that kind of inclusive direction towards Christology is helpful when you start to think like beer, well, there is like the water and the sugars you get from starches and the grain, the yeast, the hops kind of thing. But what we're seeing is that the palette of flavors more rich than you could ever imagine. Like the nose of a IPA is shaped by not the hops you use, but by the individual strains of hops you use, when you stick them in the boil, at what volume, how you dry hop them. And one of the challenges to Christology is that I think people for a long time defended the beer they were drinking as if they were defending Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right? Like if you watch the reformers argue with each other or um, you're watching the uh, – uh, arguments among uh, uh, Pentecostals critiquing the evangelicals who are then critiquing Catholic theologians and stuff. Um, I think one of the problems is they just haven't ever been to a beer tasting and recognize that, so that there's a certain beauty in really tasty versions uh, of, of diverse things. Um, the challenging thing, uh, if you're trying to include like the Christology of, let's say, radical theologians who end up uh, uh, killing God, um, it would be like a beer that bitters the beer with non-hop ingredients. And some people are just like, this isn't beer because I go by the German purity code. Uh, the only ways we can get sugars are grains, no rice, no corn, no, no, no uh, like Belgian candied sugar, none of that. Beer has to be directly sugars from grains. And I think like radical theology, queer theology, these different liberation movements are insisting that there are other ways to get the bittering element, to get the flavor element, to get this. There are different adjuncts to theology that make the experience of it among the people of God more rich and diverse. And if we just think bitterness comes from hops, then you're kind of like a fundamentalist who probably thinks that uh, that Miller Lite's triple hopped. And that that's what uh, beer is supposed to taste like. Are hops orthodox? <laughs> they should be. Um, it, it, and the sea hops. And American hops yeah. are different than everyone else's. And uh, the American church has a hard yeah. time realizing that there are other hops. <laughs> it's amazing well, how this analogy can just keep going and going. Oh, you think it, that you, well. we don't even have five hours left to go th- all the way. <laughs> well, so... Just pushing this a little more. I mean, oh, you, yeah, you spent a, a big, a big part in the early part of your book talking about the histor, historicity of Jesus in terms of his um, Jewish particularity. Um, so that seems to me, if you grant that, then some visions of Jesus would be out of bounds. So, or just, or just bad. 
right? Like, okay. you know, there's some yeah. beers, they exist, but they're no good. And I feel like the non-Jewish Jesus is kind of like PBR, where it was an award winner back in 1906 or whatnot. But we've learned better. Like, there's no way you should be giving it blue ribbons anymore. And there's no way you should be doing Christian theology where a non-Jewish Jesus, we identify as the Messiah, Savior, Lord, and that kind of thing. Uh, to do that is just to, like, uh, stab your taste buds with tastelessness. All right. So I, I'm I'm still kind of Chalcedonian in the sense that I accept the traditional formula. Well, I, I guess I'm not convinced that I should jettison that, that there's a lot of diversity that that allows me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, I, I can believe in Jesus dual nature and I don't have to be a Calvinist. Um, well, what, what's wrong with where I am? Uh, well, I, I actually don't think that the, one of the reasons so many of the stories were biographical versus other people's biographies is I wanted it to be clear that this is like Tripp's journey to reflect on Jesus and letting you in versus this is the correct journey about Jesus. Um, and, and in the book, the problem with, uh, around the creeds was, was kind of specifically isolated around the metaphysics of substance. Um, and, the second problem was the two natures doctrine. The metaphysics of substance problem is just that it doesn't make sense as a philosophy that engages science and everything anymore. But what I wanted to argue in the book, and I do in the Getting High with Jesus chapter, is that uh, if you recognize the intentions of the ecumenical councils when they're developing Christology, they're doing a couple things. One, they insist on the humanity of Jesus in its fullness repeatedly. So there were those that tried to uh, say, well, Jesus is human, accept his will, yeah. accept his mind, accept this. And they go, no, 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 those are heresies, but we're not explaining it yet. And then they add this word, the hypostatic union, which is just this like paradoxical uh, uh, philosophical word that does what other words that relate to substance aren't supposed to do. And my point was to say um, what they were protecting, what they were insisting on, the humanity of Jesus, what they're insisting on, God's unique presence in Jesus, can be described philosophically without the metaphysics of substance that have other issues connected to it than uh, the Christology. So, like, I'm not saying, oh, it's wrong. I'm saying that another way of faithfully confessing God's unique and particular yeah. presence in the person of Jesus today, affirming his humanity in his connection to God so that the revelation of God in Christ would be a trustworthy self-testimony, it can be accomplished without that metaphysic. The second part of the Chalcedonian uh, pushback is that the two-nature doctrine sets up for suffering to be isolated on the cross into the human person Jesus. Because there, the metaphysics of substance in Greek philosophy saw divine perfection connected to God's apathy, God's inability to change, feel, suffer, and such. Because if God changes, either to the better or the worse, which means either God used to be better or God just became worse, all of which, no good perfection when it goes to Greek uh, categories. And my thought is, no, that's just a bad definition of perfection. When uh, the suffering of Jesus on the cross isn't, partitioned from the divine life by saying the human suffers and the divine doesn't because that would be anti-perfection then the suffering of jesus on the cross uh, is ex expounded trinitarian in a trinitarian way and the two natures doctrine kept the church from seeing that when it's expounded in a trinitarian way god is the fellow sufferer who understands but also the one that speaks hope after each bad word, God's the one that grieves alongside not just Jesus' cross, but all crosses. And uh, that two natures thing is problematized because of the sheer perks of going yeah. the other way. But it's not, I don't say it in like a real dismissive way, like, oh, screw Chalcedon. Um, <laughs> it's more of a, yeah. can we articulate the energy of the early churches wrestling with God's presence in Christ and continued in their community, engaging other philosophies, and and such um today and that was the goal and i i really hope it didn't come across as like i think no. it's bad for you to believe it i i can't do the hypostatic union um but you know i i i could do yeah. that before some other things 
the last we're out of time on that note, James. I'll let you have the last word here briefly. What what what's your thoughts? Uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, you know, I, I on on that score, I don't have a problem with with your your um, view of of the um, hypostatic union or, or anything. I don't have a a creedal cross to bear in that sense. Um, but um, I, I do like the conversation. I, I appreciate the ways that your book challenged me. So thank you. Mr. Trevor Malkinson. 